This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. I believe that when someone was 35, they were old. Now I'm 74 and I feel like a kid. And I literally feel better physically than I think for most of my life. Part of it is thinking and part of it is staying active. Hello again and welcome to Llama, the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science, tell the stories and meet some of the enduring characters, experts from around the world, all with a common goal of helping us live longer, healthier lives, human longevity. Today, I'm joined by Jason Elias. Jason is the author of the recently published book, The Seven Graces of Ageless Aging, with the intriguing subtitle, How to Die Young as Late in Life as Possible. Jason is also an expert, a long-time expert in private practice since the 1970s, treating patients with Chinese medicine, herbal remedies, and is a teacher specialising in practices such as acupuncture and spirituality for the modern age. He is an eloquent proponent of lifestyles that are focused on maximising our health span. Jason, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Well, thank you very much, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, wonderful to talk to you. Ageless aging, it sounds like an oxymoron. What do you mean by that? I mean, it's the concept that getting old is always 10 years older than where we are. You know, it's the uh, the concept is when we're engaged with life fully, aging happens in the body, which can be worked with, but uh, spiritually, emotionally, and to some degree physically, we we can stay young as long as we believe that we can stay young. The mind is very powerful here. And that train of thought, that way of thinking, is based on your lifetime of work in this area. So we'll tell your story. I'd like to go right back to the beginning. And interesting reading in your book, you've really been around herbal remedies ever since you were a young boy, haven't you? I have. Um, My great-grandmother was called the Little Doctor on this island in Greece called Castoria. And... uh, People would go to her uh, with remedies. And my grandmother, her daughter, moved to take care of us when my father's wife died. And she catered to us with herbal remedies and poultices. So I grew up with them. And it was always a fascination. I'd go and cut grass clippings from the corner lot and pretend uh, to use that as healing modality. So, yes, it was in my life since I was probably five years old. Do you have any particular memories from that time? I know childhood memories and the things that you learn very early, and especially the, in the area that you've just talked about. Do you have any memories that really stick in your mind that have helped us frame your life? I feel it was this sense for, he, he, you know, when she did that, there was something in me that was triggered. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, my first toys were a little doctor kit with a black bag. But... You know, and I I grew up, you know, trying to treat people and talking to people. And there was this sense that that was that was the energetic vortex that was grabbing me. But I never really had the mathematical skills to go ahead and be the doctor. So I kind of moved into healing through psychology and over time through through energy, through yoga. So tell me about that learning process as you as you went to school, as you went to college, focusing not, as you say, on being a, a traditional medical doctor, but really looking at, at healing using alternative, alternative then still to a lot of people and, and alternative still today to uh, a huge number as well. How did you focus your mind on that area of, of helping people? I wasn't sure how to do it. The truth is I was wounded. I was brought up in a home really dominated by the Holocaust. My father lost his brothers. One brother came back who was released from Auschwitz. And our home was very broken. And I felt like I didn't belong. 
So uh, when I went to college, I thought psychology would be a way for me to heal myself, that, that I could understand why I felt so fragmented and isolated and alone. And the truth is, it did help. I mean, I learned that there are underlying mechanisms that work. And I, the idea that I had early that I could work with others materialized. I started working at psychiatric hospitals. One of my teachers had a center for autistic children. So I started giving back and feeling this feels right. This is, I can feel myself when I give to others. And that continues to this day. I feel I need to share, whether it's the wisdom that people have shared with me or the herbal remedies, you know, that I've studied in different cultures, you know. And then you really dug deep into it, uh, beginning an understanding of Chinese medicine and acupuncture as well. Where did you learn and how did you learn those skills? Acupuncture, <laughs> the truth is, I was doing body work. As a psychotherapist, I went to Esalen, which was a, a place for innovative therapies back in the 60s and 70s. It still exists. Where, where is that? It's called the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. And they, uh, Alan Watts, I mean, many, many people, Joseph Campbell, you know, there were people who taught therapy or philosophical ways of being in the world. And I was drawn there to learn how to do gestalt therapy because by then I was a psychologist. But when I was there, uh, people were getting, it's called Rolfed. They were getting deep massage, which was deep enough to trigger feelings, and they were encouraged to express those feelings. And I realized we carry so much of our emotional baggage in our musculature. So when they worked on me, all of these feelings came to the surface. So I wanted to know how to do that. So I stayed and I did a month with Ida Rolf because she was doing a training. And then I came back to New York and uh, got involved with other forms of body work. And it became clear to me that the body and the mind were one, that the feelings were locked in the muscles, that the, you know, it's, it was which entry we choose to penetrate, to create healing. We can go through the body and affect the mind, or we can go through the mind and affect the body. And so this turned into a career for you. And I guess at a time, and again, very similar to today, where conventional medicine still dominates. What was your driving force? And you've explained your understanding of, of, of mind and body and, and the connection there. But I'm, I'm interested to maybe just dig a little deeper into your real sort of driving force to make this uh, the lifetime career that it's become. I felt the whole journey, you know, which I wrote the memoir about the kissing joy as it flies, is really about tapping in to an energy, a synchronicity. I realized that when I was following that, when I felt whole in myself, I needed to follow that. And it was all for healing in some way, but acupuncture came to my life when I was back in New York training in the body work. And the one that was running the school I went to was an acupuncturist before it was even known in New York. And the idea of needles repelled me. I didn't like the idea of needles, but I saw the effect. And I didn't go back to acupuncture school until later, you know, back uh, around 1980. Uh, but it, was, it, it seemed to come to me. And I feel when we tap into the life force, that which is moving us forward, we feel at peace. When I'm out of that vortex, I really feel, feel discord. So for me, people say it was very brave to go around the world or study here. And I said it would have been, I don't know, braver, but, you know, to do the conventional. I just felt that people came into my life that were leading me. And I think at this point in my journey, I feel I'm home, that I can share. I never felt you know, that I had that knowledge to teach others in that way. And now I feel it's not my knowledge. It's the knowledge that I've learned from others that I'm kind of passing along. I'm going to say one more thing, which I start every one of my books with a quote by Hugh Kerr that says, all wisdom is plagiarism. Only stupidity is original. And <laughs> I feel where, you know, it's true. When you say something, it's something that's been said before, maybe in a nuanced way.
But you have, a, I think it's fair to say, a unique perspective on what you're saying and your life's work. And I'm wondering, to what extent is your emphasis preventative medicine as opposed to the treating of diseases? Because I'm sure over the years, many, many people have, will have come to you with a, a problem, a pain here, an ache there, saying, what can you do for me, Jason? And whether it's uh, mind, body, spiritual assistance that you're offering or whether it's acupuncture, you can maybe well cure that uh, that ache or that pain. But bigger picture, when we're all aspiring for a great, and I talk about health span a lot, the emphasis is really on preventative medicine, isn't it? People do usually come to me when they're symptomatic. And I explain to them that the Chinese say that it's like digging a well when someone's already dying of thirst. You dig the well, have access to the water. That Health is about maintenance of health and, you know, living well so that we create the, – the body is like a garden. If it's tended, if we give it its needs, uh, you know, the garden naturally resists infections and infestations by noxious elements. Same with the body. If, and, you know, those are the seven graces of ways to maintain health. But that's – that's the, they, they call that superior medicine in Chinese medicine. Inferior medicine is when someone comes with a symptom that needs fixing. And do you notice the, the paradigm in terms of healthcare changing, or have you noticed over the years with a, with a greater emphasis on not waiting until something needs to be fixed? But perhaps now there is a broader understanding of exactly what you're saying, that it is the preventative side of healthcare that is the most important. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I used to be ostracized. When someone were going to a, gy a gynecologist and a woman would come for fibroids or infertility and mention that they were seeing an acupuncturist and herbalist, they say, well, you go and find another gynecologist. It's very different today. It's like, oh, well, there's a lot of research that that can be helpful if you like it. You know, it's not a full embrace, but there's an opening. But I think it's also, I guess my cynical mind says that hospitals are making money because People want that. So rather than have them go outside, let's offer a, you know, a complementary medicine within our domain. And I think it's working. We're complementing each other, Western and Eastern or the garden and the battlefield. Which is all important, isn't it? And I know there are some people, perhaps in your field, who rail against com conventional medicine quite a lot. But equally, um, people like yourself acknowledge the, the complementary nature of, uh, of Eastern and Western medicine. Absolutely. I mean, that's my biggest dream. I, I don't call myself a practitioner of alternative medicine. We're not an alternative to Western medicine. So I call myself a complementary medical practitioner that there are things Western medicine is wonderful at. Don't come to me. Go to the doctor you know, you know, broken bone. I mean, there are so many things Western medicine thrives at, mostly acute things. Chronic things really, I think, work much better to me in the domain of complementary, of lifestyle, of diet, of psychology, how we look at ourselves. And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or go search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Let's um, dig uh, into some of the issues. I'm sure they're common issues that people come to you for help with. And you write in your book about the role of stress in modern life and the, the struggles that we sometimes have that are related to stress. And let's face it, we've all been through a very stressful 12, 15 months uh, with the COVID pandemic, which I think has clearly impacted people in more ways than just the disease, the, the, the sheer stress and lifestyle changes that people have had to endure. But during normal times, stress is a huge issue, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's oxidative. I mean, we knew back 
you know, in the old days, you know, that uh, sort of adrenaline, cortisol, these are the stress hormones, really injured the body, depleted the immune system, and today, you know, really uh, progresses aging significantly. So, you know, we have, in the old days, the stress was the saber-toothed tiger, or what we went out to deal with. Uh, today, the stress is more in our minds, it's more in our fears in our projections. So the same hormones that are released that are really negative, they're positive when it comes to dealing with a situation, the fight or flight. But then when that situation is gone, we come back to balance. But today those wheels are turning constantly and really interrupting our immune systems, aging us prematurely, and preventing us from appreciating the beauty that's here all along. We're in our heads. And in terms of lifestyle interventions to deal with stress, what do you talk to people about? I used to speak a lot. I mean, meditation to me is a trick word uh, because people think of it as some spiritual practice where you sit cross-legged and do a mantra, Om, you know, but the truth is it's what immerses you in the now. So I tell people the best way for most people to connect with nature, with nature, with with that moment is to go to nature, to stand outside with green around you and feel your feet planting you into the earth and open your senses to the sounds and the sights and the fragrances. Because when we're in our senses, we're not in our heads. The head creates the stress. You know, when we're in the here and now, we're really present. So in a way, it's meditation because these are the concepts of meditation. But I like to simplify it where people say, well, I don't have the time to sit cross-legged. It really is very simple. It's finding something that immerses you totally and brings some joy to your heart. And that's meditation. You talk about getting close to nature. Are you uh, a believer in, in grounding uh, this technique where people talk about physically being grounded to the earth uh, by walking bare feet on some grass or on the beach or on soil or something that is a direct connection with the earth? Uh, yes, I, I've done that my whole life. It's really, my sense is that our energy, I, I do Tai Chi, I've done it for many, many years. And Tai Chi, if you look at people doing it, their legs are squat, their knees are bent, they're really grounded, but yet the upper part of their body is really being pulled up to the sky. So I call it, we are a bridge between heaven and earth. So the grounding keeps us connected. But then if we feel connected, we can trust, you know, to move in other ways. And, you know, barefoot I like, but I'm more really concerned with feeling our legs into the earth, never locking the knees, because I feel when we lock the knees, we're not grounded. We don't have our balance. If you let your knees just be soft, you'll feel your body sinking. And it's that real connection with the earth. I like playing with it uh, visually as well, that the, you know, just like the roots of a tree ground the tree, they feed it too. So, you know, you're connecting into the earth, but you're also absorbing energy from it. And then it allows our leaves. We're like movable trees. There is valid science to support this, isn't there? Yes. You know, and also there's valid science to support being in nature, which is like in Japan, it's required that people that work there go into green spaces because they find not only are they calmer, you know, when, when they're in green spaces, but they're more efficient at work. You know, there's always both. But yeah, there's a lot of science that, uh, you know, connects the grounding. Reminds me of being a, a child and going to the seaside and getting entirely buried in the sand and in that sort of relaxed mode, as you describe it. You're not tense or standing up. You're completely engulfed in the sand apart from your head. And there is a certain feeling of a connection there that is quite unique. And I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I think so too. And I think most people, if they think about it, may have had something like that experience. I mean, it's that, you know, uh, really feeling connected. If, I, if we feel connected to the earth, we give ourselves permission to move in other directions. If, if we're not a pushover, so to speak.
Now, you write in the book about the power of the mind to heal and make the point in one chapter that uh, oftentimes in experimental studies, there is the effect of the placebo, really that results in quite a significant group of results. In other words, the placebo, and just to explain that, this is when you might be taking a a water solution as opposed to a drug. So there's a drug being tested, but you are actually not taking the drug, but you still exhibit the effects that scientists believe the drug might cause. Now, what is the significance of that? The significance is that we have the biggest pharmacopoeia, the biggest pharmacy in our bodies by our thinking. You know, uh, when you're on a roller coaster ride, your body, if you like it, your body is creating, you know, uh, oxytocin is creating various hormones that give us a sense of well being and support the immune system. Now, if you hate, roller coasters and you're on a ride, you'll be producing adrenaline and cortisol, which will deplete you. But it's amazing that the body creates the chemicals. And the truth is belief again and again in tons of studies uh, is very, very powerful. They say at least 35% of healing is the belief in the healing. So the mind is, and the studies show, you know, that if you take the, the sugar solution or the water, it will have the same effect as the drug. But, you know, they, they, they've also found not only if you believe it, you know, sometimes placebo has an effect in spite of belief. But the mind is huge and it's powerful. This is the power of, of positive thinking then. It is. You know, so if I think of myself as young, supporting those energies that keep me young. If I say every time I sit in a chair, oh, I'm getting old. If I say, oh, you know, this is too much for, you know, those those statements that we do have a direct effect instantly on our well-being. For, For good or for bad, there's a concept called nocebo, you know, which is believing negative things and they too will happen. The mind is very powerful. So it's much better if we can enlist that power rather than be run by it. Because so much of the nocebos are things we've heard from parents, from clergy, from, you know, it's like, I believe that when someone was 35, they were old. Now I'm 74 and I feel like a kid. And I literally feel better physically than I think for most of my life. But part of it is thinking and part of it is staying active. How do you help people get over those negative thoughts? Because I think even with the the very best of intentions, almost everyone will get to a point in their lives when they will do exactly as you suggested. Oh, I can't get off this chair because I'm old. Oh, I can't do this thing at the weekend because... I like to have a lie-in and my bones are feeling a little creaky and I'm not up to it anymore. I think that's almost human nature, isn't it? No, absolutely. And we do repeat what we've been told, you know, that aging is equated with uselessness. That's the word retire. What does that mean? You know, so I try to give people catches. In other words, to put little pieces of paper up, you know, to be aware when they say those things that have negative imprints, but actually put it, it's like the every day in every way I'm getting better and better, you know, those uh, affirmations. And I say, put them, I'm, I'm getting younger on your refrigerator, put it in different places and just, you know, to remember that the mind is working all the time and we so easily fall into those old habitual modes that usually really take a toll. And we can change it, but we need the awareness. It's not the should, because if I say I shouldn't do this, I'm feeding the negative because the should is part of that chain, that habitual chain where I should do this, you shouldn't do this. You know, it's part of that patriarchal. Whereas if I bring awareness to it and I say, okay, watch it, that's an old tape, delete. You know, you can use different techniques to bring it to awareness. Now, I mentioned the impact of the COVID pandemic earlier. And we are we are still emerging from that. I think there's certainly very much light, strong light at the end of the tunnel. And we are seeing normal life again, at least some of us are not necessarily everyone around the world. I think there are still challenges. But for you, 
What are the major lessons that we've learned during this time about our everyday lifestyles? I think one of the things is mortality, which is big. Uh, most of us have had people we know that got really sick from it or died from it, that it discriminated a bit toward the elderly, but the truth is it affected everyone. And I think the positive there isn't morbid, you know, it's not focusing on death, but I'm focusing on the fragility of life, that if we don't take a bite out of the apple now, when? You know, is there going to be a tomorrow? And it's this something very positive to me about, I know because I'm getting older and people who would tend to this book know they're, they are mortal, that their years are numbered. They've probably lived more years than they will live. So we need to come to grips with it. But a lot of the youth are also getting that. And I think that's important. And there is also perhaps another lesson. There is an awful lot more that we can do just to pursue a healthy lifestyle every day. And I think we've we've all learned things about ourselves and the way that we live in terms of, of hygiene and that kind of thing that I think is clearly going to help us as we move forward. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, even in my own sphere, you know, that's one of the things most of my friends, relatives, and patients kind of came out with is, I never took care of myself before. I can take walks now. I can eat healthier. I can. So yeah, I, I really feel that benefit of coming back to ourselves and not just living up for other people's expectations is big. So let's talk about your lifestyle, your daily lifestyle. I'm sure based on your decades of learning and experience, you mentioned you're 74. I, I, I'll be 74. And you feel much younger. Yeah, I feel much younger. I'm doing more than I think I've done, you know, it's I keep because I keep expanding the envelope. I'm I'm playing pickleball. <laughs> I don't know whether many people have heard of pickleball, but well, a lot of people are talking about it. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's a cross between tennis and ping pong. But it's stuff that I would have said, you know, maybe I'll hurt myself, you know, I'm, I'm you know, and I don't I really. So the more I do, the more I get out, the more I break the boundaries of you know, I'm getting more fragile. I shouldn't, you know, studies show that we're not fragile as we get older. I mean, if you don't have terrible osteoporosis and the more you do, the stronger your bones get, the stronger your muscles get and the younger, I mean, even physiologically we become, you know, there are studies that would measure, you know, various, I mean, because there's no such thing as aging in the sense of science. It's, you know, it's years. So it's deterioration of certain senses because some people can be 90 and young. Some people can be 30 and ancient. That's an interesting phrase. There's no such thing as aging. Yeah. You know, not from a medical point of view, because they base it on parameters with strength, with visual acuity, with various things, but it has nothing to do with years on the planet. So what is your day look like? How do you start? How do you get going in the morning? Right now, I, I get up and I sit in bed. I wake up at about 5, 5.30 in the morning. According to the Chinese, that's lung time. You know, every organ has a different time. And lung is about the word for breathing in, we call inspiration. And that's what the Chinese say. Yes, that's the time to be inspired, that we bring energy in through our breath. So I like getting up at that time. And in any monastery, that's the first prayer or meditation is usually at that time because they say we're closest to heaven. So I try to wake up and I don't go out. I just sit up in my bed and I just allow myself to be. So I've been doing meditation for so many years. It's not a, a thing, but I, I spend about a half an hour, 45 minutes just connecting and then I, if when I can, I start the day with a walk. I, I'm blessed that I live on a lake and there's a walk around it. And then I go to work. And, you know, a lot of my clients are getting frightened that I'm in my 70s. And, you know, are you going to be working? I say, I will never retire. If the body one day says I can't do it, I will stop. But it keeps me plugged in. I think as long as I'm plugged in and you love what you do, you know, you'll, you'll keep doing it. And, you know, to stay creative and active. And then I see patients. I spend some time writing because that I find now, you know, I used to consider myself a writer, but not an author. 
And suddenly with this book, I feel I really want to get this out. I used to write the books and I said, well, I'm really an acupuncturist or I'm, you know, I'm not going to promote it. So I feel like I would love to promote it. I somehow am learning how I've avoided that. But we're here. Tell me about your morning walk. It's something that I do every day, quite a, a vigorous walk to get the heart rate up and to really get some serious exercise. It sounds beautiful around the lake. How, how far do you go? How, how energetic is it? Half of it is energetic and half of it is Tai Chi. So I have places where I stop. It's a two mile walk. So it's really a nice long walk around the lake. And, you know, uh, for the first half, I'm walking briskly and I get my heart beating a little. And then there are these beautiful views and I call them stations of the chi, like stations of the cross, where I stop and I look at the lake and I do the Tai Chi form. So to me, I can't recommend Tai Chi strongly enough for people who might be listening to this or people who are aging, because I feel for balance, stability, one of the things when you get older is you become more afraid of falling. And it's such a wonderful practice. Everyone in China does it, who's over 50. You look at the parks and you've got hundreds of people doing the form together. So I stop and I do the form while I'm looking over the lake. So I'm very blessed to have that. If you don't have that, you can do the form in the house and there's a nearby park which you can walk in. So there's no excuse not to, not to walk. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds idyllic. And I, I agree totally with you. It is the easiest form of exercise. It doesn't cost anything. You can walk out of your front door and, and off you go. And, and you don't have to live around a lake. You can improvise pretty much wherever you live. As you look forward in your life, you've clearly got a very optimistic disposition. Do you have <laughs> goals? Do you have aspirations still about the years, hopefully the decades still ahead? Yeah, I mean, it's not a goal goal. I mean, I feel at this point, very impassioned about sharing, sharing this. I feel, you know, I've, <laughs> I mean, I, my, my aunt, who I write about in one of my books, who was a Holocaust survivor, she's 95. And she calls me about once a week, she picks up the seven graces and she'll read a sentence and she said, I love you. I love you. This is, you know, and it's like, wow, the book just for that was, you know, so worth writing that something in her taps into to that. So I feel like I love being able to share this wisdom that I've been taught from such great teachers um, that so my aspirations are I'll continue to work, but you know, uh, because it's my play. But I just look forward to each day. I want to get out. I want to meet people. I want to, you know, but it's not a goal. goal. And I haven't asked you about your diet, which of course is so important. At least I believe it is. Uh, what do you eat during the day and, and how much focus do you put on it? I put more focus on organics. I really uh, feel that the chemicals and the food colorings uh, are awful and they really are detrimental to health. I also feel that refined carbohydrates are very detrimental to health. So, you know, I tell my clients to get off the sugar. I mean, I will the first to admit that I'll have a, one, a cookie or a, I mean, I'm not rigid, but I tend not to add the white flour and the sugar to my diet. But I'm an omnivore. You know, if I eat chicken or meat, which is not as often, I make sure to get it organic. I don't want hormones and chemicals and antibiotics in it. So a well-rounded diet, plenty of vegetables, uh, restrict the refined carbohydrate, which is the sugar and white flour, and drink plenty of real water. People say, well, I drink Coke. I drink coffee. I said, yeah, drink it if you really need to. But make sure for every glass of that, you have at least a glass of water. Get hydration. Sounds like a, a good lifestyle. Sounds like a good plan. I'm curious, and I often ask people, people who are older and who've had a, a fascinating life and career like yourself, if you had the option... We don't. But if you had the option to speak to your younger self, you could speak to the Jason of age 20. What would you say to him in terms of advice about how to live his life? It's what I tell my son, actually, and I finally am living up to it, um, you know, to, to follow your passion. 
you know, it's don't be obsessed with things. Don't be obsessed, you know, with what you show, but really be into your passion. I would tell myself not to worry so much. I was always afraid that I wasn't living up to someone's expectations. I was afraid that there were people who were better at what I was studying than me, and maybe I would never be the best herbalist, acupuncturist, psychologist, whatever. All these things were things that I did, but my nature is to you know, experience different things and let them find a complement within me. So I'll never be the best at any of the things. But I'm the best me. So if I could tell myself, don't worry so much, <laughs> would be the main thing. And, you know, Jason, that's so fascinating to me because I, I often ask this this same question to people who have uh, lived uh, accomplished lives and, and uh, had great achievements. That is almost always the first response, that they wish that they hadn't worried so much as a younger person aspiring to achieve things. And then very quickly comes the thought that you enjoy what you do, you enjoy the moment, and you don't worry yourself about impressing other people. That seems to be a really common trait amongst people. Yeah, and it's such a blessing with ageing, you know, that you don't have to impress others. You know, it's like you can... There was a book which I love. It was uh, written mainly to older women, but it says, when I'm old, I'll wear purple. You know, and it's all these stories of people, uh, you know, moving into menopause, actually, and the freedoms that that gave them. It was very sweet. Jason, it's been a huge pleasure to meet you and to talk to you. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. This has been a pleasure. I love sharing. Yes, thank you. And a pleasure for me too. And if you would like to delve a little deeper into Jason's work, uh, including his book, Seven Graces of Ageless Aging, I will put the details into the show notes. For this episode, you'll find them at the Live Long and Master Aging website, llamapodcast.com. That's double L-A-M-A podcast. Com. You'll also find us at all of the major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, Audible. We're now also being shared by our friends at A Mighty Good Time at amightygoodtime.com, which is really a valuable free resource, a one-stop shop for events and activities for people who are 50 and over. In other words, in the prime of your life. We interviewed the site's co-creator, Amy Temperley, a little while ago. You can check out that episode at our website or your podcast platform of choice. Just search for Amy Temperley in the index. It's episode 141 of the podcast. Llama is a Healthspan Media production. Do take care and thank you very much for listening. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.